we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. by the name of Michael King, was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Michael later became, after some schooling, uh, became the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and later was made the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Michael King then in 1963 delivered a speech that you just heard in front of a crowd of 250,000 people on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. A speech, by the way, as a good Baptist preacher, he was slated four minutes to speak, and he drew that out to 16 minutes. Um, but you say, I, I thought his name was Martin Luther King. Well, it, it was later. He was born as, and named originally as Michael King. Uh, his dad was also a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church and had gone over to Germany from schooling, for some schooling later on in life and, and was so impressed by the, the reformer Martin Luther and his desire to go back to what does the Scripture say on truth and living out that truth, that he came back and renamed his son, Michael King, at the age of five, to become Martin Luther King, Jr. And he then lived out that same emphasis of, let's live by what the Bible says. Let's not be afraid of reformation. Let's not be afraid to live differently or act differently than community or those around us might take as common and normal, and let's live by what the Bible stands for. And so Martin Luther King really lived out to that name as well as a reformer and, um, and lived on that, uh, that basis of the true gospel of grace and love of Christ. Well, I would contest that reformation is also necessary in our day, in our church, in our churches across this land, to turn aside from the selfish and superficial malice and prejudice and to pursue genuine Christ-like love. It's not based upon a person's character. It's not or based upon a person's color. It's not based upon a person's uh, social status or economic status or any of those things. The reality is we bear the name of Christ as Christians. And it is the manifestation of godliness that even though we were unworthy and unlovely, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unhindered love. Unhindered by prejudice. Unhindered by uh, uh, the, the, the filthiness of us. Christ looked down and loved us. In fact, Paul put it this way in uh, Ephesians 5. He said, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also loved us and has given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The reality is we are to be imitators of God. Imitators of God as bearers of Christian love. Loving unconditionally. Loving no matter who it is and what their statuses are. The church... That's what it means to be a Christian. The, the church, the body of believers united in Christ is to be known by a countercultural love that's divorced from selfish malice and judgment and prejudice of this world. That's what the church ought to be. 
And the New Testament church was radically countercultural. Where in the New Testament church, for the very first time, you have, you have slaves with masters, you have the poor with the rich, you have Greeks with the Jews and Gentiles, and it's all mixed together. The church is a conglomeration and is known by and is shown by predominantly love that makes that the characteristic of it. And so James, we saw last week in James chapter number 2, begins out in this very practical book and he says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. We can't claim to, to be believers and to hold the faith that Jesus Christ loves unconditionally and we stand for that unconditional love that has transformed us and made us new and then hold that with partiality. That is, is incongruent with the rest of the, the Gospel. And so true Christianity does not leave room for prejudice. And so James is addressing in this text to these Jewish believers who are struggling with prejudice. And in verse 1-13, through 13, he, he, he lays out five points to support why love, not prejudice, needs to be the heartbeat of the church. And we saw the first three last week. We saw the, the foundation of love versus prejudice as we really see there in verse 1, that, that we are believers in Lord Jesus Christ and we hold that faith. The Lord of glory has mentored it or, or modeled it and demonstrated it for us and we cannot hold that with prejudice. We have to hold that with love for every person. We saw secondly the function of example or the example of, of prejudice versus love as He lays out there if a man comes into your assembly one and and. and, and fine apparel and gold rings and all those things. Another guy comes in in old clothes and, and is dirty and obviously economically does not have what the other guy has. He says, it is wrong for you if you show partiality to the one and say, oh, you sit here in this prized place and of a place of honor and you tell the man who economically would not have as much and you say, you, you stand off to the side. Or you sit here in this, in this lowly position. He says, That's, that is wrong then he goes into, not only is it wrong, but he says the foolishness of prejudice versus love. And he asks some rhetorical questions. Is, don't, don't the poor oppress you? Don't the poor blaspheme that, that holy name, the name of God, the name of Christ that you claim to be? Don't they blaspheme that holy name by which you are called? He said it, it is, not only is it, unethical and, and, and wrong, it is immoral and sinful to be prejudiced towards people based upon superficial means and to judge them on those basis. That's what the word partial has the idea of. To raise up the face of someone in order to make a judgment call upon their character. Or to determine their value really is what that means. To determine someone's value and worth based upon superficial means. He says that is, that is wrong. Well, this morning I want to finish that, this discussion or this argument that James is placing before us. And I want to finish this section by noting the last two uh, points here of the fulfillment and the fix of love versus prejudice. So let's look into God's perfect law of liberty the liberty that allows us to walk in grace, the liberty that allows us to walk in love and to experience that love as believers who have taken that and experienced that for ourselves. Let's look at what the perfect law of liberty has for us together in this final verses as we close this up. But let's have a word of prayer together before we begin. God, I am thankful that we have the opportunity to come into your throne room not because we were deemed worthy by our own merits. Lord, we are filthy. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. We have nothing in and of ourselves by which we merit Your good pleasure and Your mercy and grace. But thank You that You loved us. That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we now have access to You through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ. If we know You as our Savior, if we have accepted His work on the cross, and so, God, I pray that You'd help us as a church as we examine Your Word and these practical words from James to us and this inspired Scripture. Lord, I pray that You would help me to say what You'd have me to say that would speak to our hearts and that we would examine if we are holding any bitterness or prejudice or partiality towards anyone. Lord, that we might be the hands and feet of Christ, that we might be known by love 
for one another. So God, I pray that you would work in our midst through this today. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go into our fourth point then this morning, which is this. <clears throat> the fulfillment of love versus prejudice. Notice there he goes into, we're going to see in verses 8 through 11, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So he has already laid out the argument from logic regarding the foolishness of prejudice. Now he's going to go a little bit further and go straight to the source of the law to make his case in two points here in the fulfillment of this. And he makes it in two points. First of all, is the standard of the law. The standard of the law deems for us that this is not right. He says, he begins by, by giving a hypothetical, if you fulfill the royal law. Now it's called the royal law uh, because it comes from the King. The Lord of glory that we just saw. The Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he just mentioned that in chapter 2 and verse 5. He's the Lord and so He's the one who has given us the royal law. He has given us the law that we are to love one another. So the King is the authority giving noble and excellent laws and it, He lists out the royal law of Christ. Here it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says if you do this, you do well. You do excellently is really what the term there is speaking of. And, um, and so, he singles out the command that Jesus repeated from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, in fact, that's given to us six different times in the Gospels by Jesus Christ, and numerous times as well in, in, uh, as well in the epistles. And uh, he's referred to it as the second greatest commandment in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, he was approached by a rich young ruler, um, a lawyer who's trying to test him, trying to stump him and to, to stumble him up a little bit. And, and, he, and he asks the question, well, what is the, the greatest commandment in the law? In Matthew 22, he asked Jesus Christ, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Now, to understand that, you need to understand a little bit of the background of the, Judea, the Jewish system regarding the laws. The Jewish system that the rabbis and the scribes had actually determined there are 613 laws in Scripture by which they were to maintain and obey. Now they broke those into two different segments, two different categories. The Talmud, the Jewish teaching tells us, the first is the, the positive ones. 248 positive or thou shalt do this. 248 positive teachings or commands and they said that that number corresponds, this is just the Talmud of the Jewish law, that number corresponds with the number of bones and vital organs in the body. It's the idea of you should, with all your being, do this. That was their idea, their thinking. Then they also took out that 630, after you take out 248, there is 365 remaining uh, thou shalt not, the negative commands, which they said corresponded with one for every day of the year. However, it wasn't you just got to pick one for the day. It was you had to still do all of them every day of the year. Now, can you imagine the challenge of 613 laws? And so this, this man is coming. They, they debated about this all around the time. Well, what are the most important ones? We've got to determine. We, we, we aren't keeping all 613. And so which ones are the vital ones that we need to keep? And so he comes to Jesus trying to really trap him and put him in the middle of an argument of all, all that's been debated around. He says, well, which is the, the greatest commandment of the law? Which is the one that is most important for us to hold? And Jesus says this in Matthew 22. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. He's quoting there. First of all, love God above everything else. But he says right beyond that, he says, and the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these hang all the commandments. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
Now, what he is saying is this. All of the laws, over the 600 that, were, that they had debated and they had come around, or the Ten Commandments, all of them hang really on these two things. Love God, number one, and love your neighbor as yourself. You even think about the Ten Commandments, they hang on those two things. The first four commandments have to do with our vertical relationship to God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make in yourself any graven image. You shall not take the name of your Lord your God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All those are relegated. I love God, number one, with all my heart, soul, and mind. Those four are going to hang on behind it. Following behind is the latter six, ten commandments. Honor your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness and do not covet. All those have to do with our relationship to mankind. Love your neighbor as yourself bears the standard by which all of those ones hang. And so what he's saying is, this is the primary commands. And so as we think about it, as he's dealing with, James is dealing with the, the human relationship, the horizontal relationships as we relate to each other, brothers and sisters in Christ in the church, as we relate to other people outside of the church, the primary responsibility as we relate to people is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, if you do that, you do excellently. You do well. But, if you show partiality, he says, you have become transgressors of the law. If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And so, that kind of brings up then a question that was also asked of Jesus in regard to the same situation. Well then, who is my neighbor? And what does this look like then that I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself? Does that just mean that I... That, that I uh, you know, I'm to tolerate someone or to not be rude to someone? No, absolutely not. And so Jesus then gives a parable which, if you study through the Gospels, you, you've probably come across or are familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan to define what this really looks like and who is our neighbor. Now just quickly, in Luke 10, here's the scenario. He gives us an illustration of a guy who's leaving out of Jerusalem He's going down to Jericho, and it, is a, it was one of the most dangerous roads to traverse in that day on foot by yourself because there was robbers all along the way. And this guy gets mugged by robbers, is beat up and, and robbed and left for dead. And it says, and by chance, here comes along the way a priest, and then a Levite, and then a Samaritan. And they see this man and they see him off there who's along the side all bloodied and beat up and left for dead in need of great medical attention. And the priest comes by and he sees that and he goes to the other side of the road and walks by. And then there's the, 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 the Levite as well who was part of the guys who, who worked in the temple and took care of those needs in the temple. And he sees the guy as well, does the same thing, goes to the other side and leaves and goes his way. But a Samaritan, now think about this. The Samaritans were the ones who had been mistreated by the Jews. They were considered half-breeds. In fact, if you remember, even back in Nehemiah, when Nehemiah was building the walls of Jerusalem back, the Samaritans came and said, can we help you in this matter? And Nehemiah and the men, the rest of the city said, no, you have no right nor hand in this matter. And they wouldn't even allow them because they weren't fully Jews. And this Samaritan comes by and sees this Jewish man alongside the road, beat up, robbed, left for dead. And he comes over, he gets off of his animal, he comes over and he mends the guy's ailments and, and he puts him on his own animal, takes him to a place where he can get medical attention, pays for the medical attention, pays for the care, and says, if he needs anything else, I'll come back and I'll pay for it. And he says, Jesus asked the question, now which of those was the neighbor? And the man who has so much prejudice asking the question of Jesus, he still won't say Samaritan. He said the guy who showed love. You see the, the deep-rooted prejudice that we sometimes can hold. But he says that's the guy who's a neighbor, who went out of his way, who saw someone in need and cared for them and loved them as himself. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
So the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we really go out of our way to love people like that? Do we recognize the people around us as our neighbors? Do we go out of the way to not just say, boy, I'll be praying for you. Well, that's an easy thing to say. Honestly, I do the same thing many times, and I do pray for you. But what if we go further and say, what can I do for you? Uh, can, I, can I help you know, at your house, something you need? But to genuinely say, I want to help meet that need because I want to love my neighbor as myself. And so we, we, we see that this, the law is the standard that He's given out to us. And, and so we are to love in action. Love compassionately. In fact, we see there really with the, the example of the Good Samaritan, it started with, first of all, perception. Let me be perceptive. Let me see the needs. Asking God, help me to see needs around me. You know, I doubt any of those guys woke up that morning thinking, oh, I'm going to find a guy left for dead alongside the road. But being perceptive, when God brings people into your life, being perceptive to say, here, here's somebody that I can minister to. Here's somebody that I can show love to. And it starts with perception. But then it moves from perception to compassion or emotion. Where the guy was moved with compassion, it says there. And he showed him mercy. And then it moves into action. Perception, compassion, action. Where he says, now I'm going to do something about it. I will meet that need. When was the last time you put your arms around someone who was poor and put some money in their hand? Or someone that was, so some, that last time you came around someone who's of a different color or culture and put your arm around them and called them your brother? When's the last time someone that, that you put your arm around someone who was the other kids at school pick on or, or they call a nerd or is not well-liked, and he's uncool, and, and young people, when's the last time you went to that person and said, I'm going to put my arm around you, and I will befriend them because I'm going to love my neighbor as myself? Boy, you have no idea the impact that that makes on someone. Uh, when they've been told many times, I am less than anyone else, and the people come around them and love them, it makes such a difference. And so we see there the standard of the law that pains for us. But then secondly, the singularity of the law. In verses 10 through 11, he now builds on this and, and, he, and he basically says, listen, if, if you keep one or, or you break one of these, you're guilty of breaking it all. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that because of the 613 laws that they had developed, they had they'd categorized them into the heavy laws, the most important, and the light laws. And basically, they kind of made a, a works-based religion, religion system that, well, if I do enough of the heavy laws and I, and I hold those, that's going to weigh down good for me and I'll have good on my merits. And maybe I don't keep all the rest that are negatives against me, but I've got enough of the heavy laws, that's good. It's the same idea that many people that have in a works-based religious system where they think, if I can do enough good, if I can earn enough, then, then maybe my good will outweigh my bad. And Jesus and James here really just sl slams that and says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in just one point, he's guilty of all. You're guilty, he says. And, and, and it's interesting because he then frames out and looks like, it looks at these different things and he, he paints a picture of, do not, if he, he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you've, committed a, you've been a transgressor of the law. You think, well, why did he all of a sudden just raise partiality and now he's bringing up adultery and, and murder? These, are, these were the heavy ones. These are major ones because he's saying, listen, the reality of being prejudiced or partial is to that degree of what God's standard is. Just as negative as that would be to go out here and murder someone, just as negative as it is to go out and commit adultery, he said, God raises prejudice or any type of breaking of the law to that type of standard. He says that God's standard is perfection. He's going to judge in righteousness. And so he picks two of these major ones here. And he says, the law is one. In other words, the law is a unity. It's like a chain. You break one of the links and the entire chain is broken. That's the idea there. And so we see, first of all, the fulfillment of love versus prejudice. 
He says that has to be complete. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now let's look at lastly then, the fifth point, what is the fix of this? How do we fix this? What if we say, yeah, I struggle with some partiality or some prejudice in my life and, and maybe I've sized up people based upon different elements, some, some superficial things, and you're saying, what do I do about it? How, how do I fix this? Well, James gives us two very, very practical and excellent advices. And the first is this, conduct yourself in the mirror of God's law. Conduct yourself in the mirror of God's law. Notice what he says there as he goes on and, uh, and he says, uh, So speak and so do. Both imperative commands. Speak and do. Conduct yourself, acting, doing, speaking, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Conduct yourself as, as if you're the one that's going to be judged by the law of liberty. So what he's saying is this. Look inwardly at your own life first. Remember, we've seen this term, law of liberty, already in James. Law of liberty comes up in chapter 1 and verse 25. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What was the law of liberty? It's the Word of God. He says, let me take the Word of God and let me apply it to my life first and recognize that as, as Hebrews 4.12 talks about, that is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I'm going to be judged by the law that's going, to, that's going to cut me open and determine what is my heart and determine who I really am and determine if it is, it is motivated and, and is, 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 is driven by love. He says, so check. He said, we've got to check ourselves. Look at ourselves first. Look in that mirror. Yogi Bear, in his witty way, used to say, you can see a lot by looking. That's true. You can see a lot by looking. When we begin to take the Word of God and look into it and say, well, let me look at it as it applies to me first. Now, let me check me. And so, he says, conduct yourself as one who will be judged by the law of liberty. And so, I, I dare say that a, a prejudiced person is a person who is not in the Word of God. A prejudiced person is one who has decided to, to ignore parts of God's Word. And they don't want to deal with that for themselves. Partiality and prejudice always sets aside those things. Someone who does not love their neighbor as their self is ignoring God's Word. And so it's driven by, let me apply it to me first. Because at that point, when a man looks into the law of liberty, he ceases to be a judge, but rather steps into the judgment. He steps into recognizing, wow, I've got work to do on myself. And so, who am I to look at somebody else and size them up and determine their worth and their character based upon superficial things when I recognize I'm not worthy to be the judge any longer? I am worthy of judgment. And merely by the grace of God can I even stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we recognize our, our position based upon uh, the grace of God, we have no longer position to be a judge. And that's why Jesus even said in John 8, 31-32, to the Jews who believed, that's who He's talking to here, if you abide in My Word, you're My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's the law of liberty. We begin to check ourselves on that. So conduct yourself in the mirror of God's law, but then secondly, conduct yourself in the mercy of God's love. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. And so we see now, after we look in the law of liberty and see our sinfulness, the, the one truth that is so overwhelmingly comforting is that God is rich in mercy. He says, so if you're so willing to accept God's mercy, God's love and compassion to overlook your sins and overlook your shortcomings and love you in spite of that, he says, that ought to be the motivator. Conduct yourself in the mercy of God's love and live that out <clears throat> in your life. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2, in, in light of our once being dead in sins, he says, but God, who is rich in mercy 
Because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Mercy is a word that signifies to feel sympathy for, to, to, with, to feel the misery that someone else has been feeling, to come alongside and partner up with. And it's a misery, it's, it's a compassion that has moved to action. That is, a, boy, I love them and I care for them and I don't want to do something about it. And so we've we got to get inside their skin and to feel what they've gone through. And so the practical synonym would be love. The practical synonym to mercy, to conduct ourselves in the mercy of God's love is to be imitators of God and give love. That's exactly what James is saying here to this church. The Jews who were spread around and it's interesting because Jesus said in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. It's the one beatitude that when we give it out, we return it back. It's the only one. And, and that's what James is saying. For judgment is without mercy, the one who has shown no mercy. If you don't show mercy, he says, God's going to be judgmental upon you with the same regards. Mercy, however, triumphs over judgment. What a, what a level that that raises that to. The more we understand how much mercy we receive, the more we give to others. And the more mercy we show, the more mercy we get. And so there you have the mercy triumphing over judgment. Back in the earth, well, I guess it was the 19... 19- 40s, uh, general manager for the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, if, if you followed Major League Baseball back in those times, was Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey had decided that he was going to hire the first black Major League Baseball player. And, um, and so he started talking to actually his main PR guy, the guy that was, uh, the guy that did all the announcing, Red Barber. Red Barber grew up in the deep south. And he came into Red Barber and said, I, w- I want to have a lunch with you. And he sat down with Red Barber at this lunch and he said, listen, I have something I want to tell you. He said, it's something that uh, I told my family, they all think I'm crazy, they're against it, but I'm going to do it anyways. I am going to hire an African American to play on our baseball team. I'm going to do it and I want you to know I'm going to do it. He wanted to get out ahead of it. Red Barber walked out of that meeting, walked, went to his home, and he told his wife, and he said, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. Now, Red Barber was a Christian and had stood up for certain rights. In fact, he had stood against the, 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 the prejudice against Jews and those things and actually had used this text to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, slowly over time, God changed his heart and, and Branch Rickey did hire... Uh, uh, Jackie Robinson, to be playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. What's interesting is that years before this, actually, years before there was a Jackie Robinson playing for the Dodgers, the University of Michigan baseball team went down to South Bend, Indiana to play Notre Dame in a baseball series of games. They were checking into the hotel that day, and um, in the days there before credit cards, computers, and those things, and, and the coach... Uh, the coach would introduce each player as he came to the desk and they would sign in. When his catcher approached and was introduced, the clerk drew back the sign-in registry and wouldn't allow him to sign in the hotel because he was a black man. And he said this, he said, we don't register Negroes in this hotel. The coach stood there stunned. And he said, "Well, well, now this is the University of Michigan baseball team and we're here as guests of Notre Dame University. To which the clerk replied, I don't care if it is the University of Michigan, football and baseball teams, we don't register Negroes in this hotel. And by that time, it was gathering quite a crowd. Everybody in the, in the lobby was quiet, watching to see what was going to take place. And so the, the coach quickly said, well, how about this? Can we at least just have him stay in my own room? He doesn't have to register, just have him stay in my room and that'll be fine. Well, the clerk thought for a moment, decided that, that would be alright and he wouldn't register him, but he could stay in the coach's room. When the coach got up to the room, he found the young man sitting on the bed and sobbing. 
He was pulling at the skin on his hands. And here was a young man who had been raised in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, had never been down in the Deep South, and had never experienced the, the prejudice and the hatred of superficial malice over things that didn't matter. And he was weeping there on the side of the bed, and, and he said to the coach, he looked up at the coach, he said, It's my skin, coach. It's my skin. If, if I could just tear it off, I'd be like everybody else underneath. If I could just see underneath. The coach vowed on that day he would do something to address this injustice. And years later, as the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, he hired Jackie Robinson. You know, we may not take it to that extreme. We have that kind of prejudice. But we need a love like that. We need a, we need a love like Branch Rickey, who says, I could care less what the superficial matters of someone around me are. Because I understand underneath, they're a human being that God loves. He did not make a mistake with. And I will love them as God loves. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and love as he loves. That's the command. That's what James is pushing for us. Are, are, we, are we guilty sometimes of prejudice? As you look at your life, is there times where it's been easy for you to have prejudice towards someone. Well, I'd challenge you. Look into the perfect law of liberty. Let that wash you over and experience and see God's mercy that you desperately need. And then show that same mercy and love back out to others. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. And the challenge to us to, to recognize and love as you love. Lord, we thank you that in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of our unworthiness, You declared us worthy. And so, Father, I pray that You would help us to look inside each of our lives. And Lord, challenge us that we might then <clears throat> love and show compassion and mercy that we might love our neighbor as ourself. And so, Lord, in those areas where we may struggle with that, maybe it's somebody in this room that we've held some bitterness against or maybe it's someone in this room that, that we've kind of judged them by the wrong basis and we've not been willing to look at our own self first. God, would you convict us of this? Help us to not be transgressors of your law, but help us to be walking in love as dear children. Lord, help that you would protect the sweet spirit of unity and love in this place. God, thank you for a church that does care for each other, but help us to grow in that. And may our testimony to the community and world around us be even stronger and emboldened by that sweet love and unity together. And if there's areas that need to be made right, may we make them right today, but start here with you in our own hearts. Lord, we thank you for this time together. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.